Hello world, welcome to another edition of Tech Deck Deck Tech, the EDH deck building show with a finger skateboard as a stupid gimmick. Ladies and gentlemen, I would kindly ask you not to underestimate the Technicolor Morphling that is Chromat. There's more than one way to build a five color mana base, but you're always gonna see Command Tower, Reflecting Pool, Exotic Orchard, usually lands that tap for four or five colors that enter the battlefield untapped. You just can't get any better than that. I also run uh, Fetch Lands. If they're in your budget, they work wonderfully in conjunction with Shock Lands, but that's not news to anyone, I'm sure. Felwar Stone, this is a fantastic budget card. Like in a monocolored deck, I will run a two mana mana rock that enters the battlefield tapped, right? The Diamond Cycle, this is, you usually a five color mana rock that enters untapped for the same mana cost. Put it in like all of your decks. In five color decks, I do tend to prefer the three mana mana rocks that tap for any color as opposed to, you know, two mana mana rocks, just because uh, it, it's worth the extra turn and the extra investment of mana to make sure that your mana is perfect. These cards right here uh, are, are the inspiration behind the entire deck. The reason that this deck had to go into five colors is because I wanted to build a deck with with all 10 of the Ravnica Karoos. If you're not familiar with this cycle, um, they tap for two mana, not just one, and when they enter the battlefield, um, you have to return another land to your hand. The Ravnica Karoos can be a little bit awkward if, for example, one of them is your second land drop of the game and you haven't played another card other than lands. It forces your first turn land back into your hand, putting you at eight cards and you have to discard. But beyond that, um, we have built the deck to just abuse these things. Amulet of Vigor, this thing turns bounce lands basically into a ramp for one turn anyway. Effects that let you play extra lands on your turns um, are really good. You know, if my opening hand includes these cards, turn one, I play Command Tower, drop an Exploration, get an extra land, drop each and every turn, play Boros Garrison, return Command Tower to my hand, I am ramp one mana and have a guaranteed land drop for my next turn. And then I have a suite of creatures that ramp by untapping lands. You can understand why they're really good in a deck that runs all 10 Karoos. They're basically twice as effective. I want to shine a spotlight on Stone Cedar Hierophant in particular, uh, she is the MVP of this deck. You can squeeze her on some turns, I'm not exaggerating here, for like 20 mana because um, I also run uh, Dawn's Reflection and Market Festival, they're uh, functional reprints of each other, that allow an enchanted land to add two additional mana to your mana pool whenever it's tapped. So slap one of these or both of these on a single Karoo and Stone Cedar Hierophant nets you, what's that, six mana every time it's tapped. So before we get too carried away talking about the sweet tech in this deck, um, I do want to round out the mana base. Um, I also run Scrylands, which synergize wonderfully with the Ravnica Karoos. I used to run all ten of them, but I realized I really only need um, one Scryland on the battlefield to continue to bounce it back to my hand, get a Scry next turn, like get a Scry every other turn out of them. So um, I just run um, the four that have green in them. I also run Juke Bog. If you can get multiple ETBs of this, you can just hose any graveyard based deck like repeatedly. Now, because we're in five colors, there's not a lot of room for colorless utility lands, but I do run two of them. Um, Reliquary Tower is just good. And Kessig Wolf Run, like if we're producing 20 extra mana on a turn with Stone Cedar Hierophant, this enables us um, to one shot an opponent with Chromat. It is a big, brutal, aggressive mana base designed to plunk lands into play at a rapid clip so that you can make back breaking end game style play while your opponents are still, you know, dirtling through the mid-game. The idea of an engine continues. It's a consistent theme through the rest of the deck's spells. First and foremost, um, with cards that draw us more cards. <laughs> Seer's Sundial turns a surplus of mana and extra land drops on each of your turns into just a consistently full hand. Top is just good. Brainstorm is just good. Stroke is just good. <laughs> oh god, this is one of my favorite cards. If you're looking to improve your commander game on a budget, Flight of Fancy must be, like, what, 15 cents? I recognize granting a creature flying on an enchant is a bit of an underwhelming effect, but drawing two cards is nothing to sneeze at, right? Any card that has an effect on the board state and replaces itself is good. Any card that has an effect on the board state and replaces itself times two is Excellent. The engine continues. Draw cards, draw cards, draw cards, draw cards. Okay, I did not pay $100 for this. I pulled it in a booster pack. Draw cards, draw cards, draw cards, draw cards with the Chromat flavor, um, and draw cards. Uh, all told, these are 15 spells that serve basically the purpose of drawing more cards. Those are the highest octane cards when it comes to, you know, puking extra lands onto the battlefield and making sure that our hand is consistently full, if not overflowing. But uh, the engine idea continues well 
well into our utility cards. If you're looking for uh, budget cards in Commander, any card that says draw a card, just like uh, Flight of Fancy, is fantastic. Cerulean Wisps is basically a dark ritual effect for us with our mana dorks that untap lands and it replaces itself. Um, uh, Psychotic Fury allows us to potentially one-shot an opponent with our Commander and it replaces itself. Uh, Ground Seal, uh, we only run one effect in here that targets the graveyard, so we figure in an average game it will disproportionately hamper our opponents and it replaces itself. Uh, Baleful Strix is an excellent blocker and it replaces itself. Um, Repulse, this is one of my favorite cards in Commander. It's a budget card, it just, you know, it's, a, it's an answer that replaces itself. Um, Shielding Plaques grants Hexproof to either Chromat or say like our Stone Seeder Hierophant and it replaces itself. Uh, Slice and Twain, you know, just a naturalize that replaces itself. And Demonic Tutor, I mean, okay, it doesn't technically say draw a card on it, but it might as well say draw any card, right? Um, and then we have time walk effects, which also don't say draw a card, but if you're taking an extra turn, you're drawing an extra card and getting an extra land drop. Like it's uh, an explore at worst and you know potentially a game winning play at best. The last part of what I consider to be this deck's engine, which is the vast majority of the deck, um, would be Future Sight and its functional reprint with legs, Magus of the Future. They just synergize with everything in this deck in so many different ways, right? If we have a surplus of mana, uh, these cards allow us to just play spell after spell after spell after spell. If we have extra land drops just because we hit a land on top of our library doesn't mean that the Future Sight chain ends. Running cantrips, draw spells, fetch lands, and scry lands allows us to change the top card of our library if it's not something we want to cast with Future Sight. When one of these cards hits the table, this deck just explodes. Opponent whether they realize it or not, usually have two, maybe three turns to deal with them before you close out the game. That is this deck's massive, massive engine. I just counted, and unless I miscounted, it's 83 cards, the vast majority of this deck. The question is, okay, what do we do with it? And first and foremost, we have some answers to threats opponents might stick to the board. Um, Terminus, Bonfire of the Damned. You might have noticed there's a minor miracle sub-theme. There's also, what is it, Temporal Mastery and Reforge the Soul. They just work really well. I mean, with Future Sight, you can see them coming up. With Scrylands, you often know if they're coming up. With Brainstorm, with Jace the Mind Sculptor, Sensei's Divining Top. You can often set up miracles and use them as ridiculously costed instant speed answers. We also have you know, Cyclonic Rift, Chaos Warp, Putrefy, Mortify, just solid removal spells. I might replace these last two with like a Beast Within an Oblation or something. Next we have some cards that don't really fit in with any other section of the deck. They're just generally pretty good. Um, Limduel's Vault is a goddamn wall of text, but it's two mana, instant speed, lets you look at the top five cards of your library, put them back in any order, or if you don't like them, you can pay one life, set them aside, look at the next five, and you can keep doing that, paying one life at a time until you hit the five that you like. It's a janky vampiric tutor that lets you set up, you know, future miracles, you know, whatever you want, really. Clever Impersonator is just the definition of a utility card, right? It's anything you need it to be. All Sun's Dawn. Okay, when we were talking about Ground Seal, this is the card I was talking about. It's the only card in here that targets the graveyard, but it's worth it, right? In a five color deck, you can potentially get five cards back from your graveyard to your hand. And even if you're not in five colors, this is a fantastic budget option. In a three color deck, it's a strictly better restock. In a two color deck, it's a more aggressively costed restock, assuming you have two different colors in your graveyard. Really good card. It would be a crime not to include Chromanticore in a Chromat deck, right? It would be a total flavor fail. Kessig Wolf Run with Chromanticore is brutal. Uh, we also run Wargate, which is another quintessential utility card. We can search up a clever impersonator if we need to. We can Wargate for zero and just grab a bounce land. That's not a terrible play. Or we can use it to grab one of our win conditions, which we'll get to in just a moment. Um, and finally, my favorite card in all of Magic. In the most basic sense, Possibility Storm creates a game state where the player who can cast the most spells wins. And, you know, when I'm playing Chromat, that player is almost always me, right? Chromat doesn't care so much, you know, which spells we're casting. It's just designed to play spell after spell after spell after spell, hence, you know, running Future Sight. Speaking of Future Sight, it synergizes... Uh, uh, it's, uh, 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 future Sight plus Possibility Storm equals you win, basically. Possibility Storm only triggers off of spells cast from your hand, so if you're casting spells off the top of your library, uh, they'll resolve normally. Alternatively, if you don't like whatever's on top of your library, simply cast a spell from your hand, trigger Possibility Storm, and you'll have a new top card when all is said and done. Meanwhile, your opponents can't
can't respond to whatever threats you're trying to stick because anything they try to do will simply trigger Possibility Storm and it's a shot in the dark. Finally, uh, we have the deck's win conditions. Set to the Deathless, often you just have enough mana with your crazy amounts of lands that you can have X be some lethal amount. Same basic logic with Exsanguinite, although it's twice as hard and not as likely. Um, if you don't have quite enough mana, you can produce infinite mana using Freed from the Real or Pemmin's Aura, which have the all-important ability, Enchant Creature for one blue, to untap enchanted creature. Say you have a voyaging satyr on the battlefield, enchant it with uh, freed from the real, uh, and you have a demir aqueduct which produces blue-black whenever it's tapped. Tap for blue-black, tap it to untap, then use the blue that's floating to untap this creature, tap for blue-black again, untap it, use the extra blue to untap it, and you will have infinite black floating. Or if you have, say, a Dawn's Reflection or Market Festival, uh, you can do it with any land and produce infinite of every color. Let's goldfish a game! Woo! One, Two, three, four, five, six, seven. We're a little bit lacking in the land department here. I think the mulligan is we keep the Felwer Stone and pitch six. One, two, three, four, five. You kidding me? Six. Uh, another no lander. We're gonna pitch uh, six this time to draw five, keeping the Felwer Stone once again. One, two, three, four. Five. This is definitely a keepable hand. It doesn't have a super specific plan, but we know that we're going to be dropping the top and fishing for something to do with our apparent abundance of mana. If nothing else, we can cast Chromat or in a pinch even sack our commander's fear to uh, fish for more juicy spells. We're going to draw a breeding pool. Okay, we don't hate that. We'll go ahead and play that. We'll take the shock on it and we'll drop a Sensei's Divining Top. Upkeep. I don't think we want to top. I think that we'll save that mana so we can cast Felwar Stone. Coalition Relic, okay, we've got lots of gas, nothing to do with it. Uh, I think we'll take the shock on a godless shrine, tap that, and bring out the Felwer Stone, then end step before our turn, tap the Felwer Stone to top. I think I want Blood Crypt Argothian Elder, then concentrate, so that when we take our turn, it looks like this. We will untap, this is turn three, we will draw the Blood Crypt, um, we will play the Blood Crypt, take the shock, we're shocking ourselves to death here. Um, we're gonna crack the top, to draw the Argothian Elder, putting the top on top of our library. Then for four mana, we're going to cast the Argothian Elder and proceed to our next turn. So this is turn four. We're going to draw our Divining Top. Um, we are going to play a Bloodstained Mire. We know from our earlier Divining Top activation that we have a Concentrate left on top of our library, and on one hand, that seems like a great spell to cast because we're beginning to run out of gas, four cards in hand, but I think it's worth it to crack the Bloodstained Mire so that we can just ramp really, really hard and just hope that we can top into something to do with it, or if nothing else, cast Chromat. Now they say in Magic that if you don't finish the game at one life, you haven't fully utilized a resource, and this game is a testament to that between my Shock lands and fetch lands, uh, worth it. Depends on the table, honestly, but uh, we're ramping aggressively. We're going to Felwar Stone plus three more mana for four total, put a Dawn's Reflection on Godless Shrine, then tap for one, two, three, activate Argothian Elder to untap, untap. We'll go down to two mana floating to cast uh, Sensei's Divining Top, then go down to one mana floating. We'll say it's a blue um, to look at the top three cards of our library. Let's do that now. Oh, very interesting. We want the Urban Evolution right now, so we're gonna put it on top. We still have one mana floating. We're going to crack the top to draw the Urban Evolution, put the top on top. One, two, three, four, five. We will cast Urban Evolution to draw three cards, so we get the top. We get the Temple of Plenty and we get the Explore. We may play an additional land this turn thanks to Urban Evolution. So uh, we will play the Temple of Plenty. We will scry one, Time Warp. We leave that on top because we leave that on top. We will draw the Time Warp, start by floating one, two, three. We will cast the top. Um, we will activate the top. The one mana we have floating will still be a blue. Um, we will look at the top three, Baleful Strix. Mull Drifter and Gruel Turf. We want to put the Gruel Turf on top, uh, so we will. We have a blue floating. We will tap, uh, I suppose, uh, let's do a green from the Stomping Ground um, to cast an Explore. 
I play an additional land this turn and draw a card. We will draw the Gruel Turf. Uh, Gruel Turf will make for the first land for turn. I'll bounce Stomping Ground back to my hand. Uh, then I will re replay the Stomping Ground. I'll take the Shock on it again, I suppose. Then for one, two, three, uh, we will cast a Commander Sphere. Then for one, two, three, um, we will cast a Coalition Relic. Then we will use the Argothian Elder to untap the Godless Shrine, to untap the Gruel Turf. Um, and then for one, two, three, blue, blue, um, we will cast Time Warp. We'll take an extra turn after this one, and then we'll put a charge counter on our Coalition Relic. We're still going to count this as turn five because, you know, it's our sixth turn, but we got there with a Time Warp. There's nothing left in our hand, but that will change with the Mold Drifter that we knew was coming, thanks to our sense of divining top. Uh, main phase, the counter comes off of Coalition Relic. It'll tap for a blue. We'll tap the Gruel Turf to evoke the Mold Drifter. We will draw the Baleful Strix we also knew was coming, and a Mystery Card. Ooh! <laughs> it's always weird gold fishing factor fiction because we lack opponents and a board state to contextualize things with, but uh, we'll try it. One, two, three, uh, four. Cast it, then reveal one, <laughs> two, three, four, and five. This one was actually relatively easy. I mean, the opponent could make a mistake and give us more than just the Temporal Mastery, but we take Temporal Mastery even if everything else is in the other pile. We're going to uh, tap the Blood Crypt to spin the top, look at the top three. I have nine mana available to me if I'm holding up Coalition Relic so as to put a charge counter on it, right? One, two, three, four. This guy taps for five on top of that. I know I can cast Baleful Strix plus Temporal Mastery, but that's nine exactly. That'll draw me the Rakdos Carnarium, get me a land drop for turn, get me a Scry Land back in my hand for next turn, which means that whatever I put second will be my draw next turn, whatever I put third, I, 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 I could potentially dig deeper with the Divining Top and scry something else away, but the third card I likely will be scrying away with Temple of Plenty. I think this is the order I want to go with. So then I tap Commander Sphere for a black, Breeding Pool for a blue, I will cast Baleful Strix, I will draw the Rakdos Carnarium, I will play the Carnarium as my land for turn, trigger on the stack, I will float a mana, I will bounce Temple of Plenty back to my hand, I have one floating, uh, two, I can untap two more lands uh, to have three, four, five, six, seven, um, and then I will cast Temporal Mastery to take an extra turn after this one. During my end step, I'll put a charge counter on Coalition Relic. Still turn five. We will draw the Seer Sundial that we knew was there. During the beginning of our main phase, Coalition Relic will trigger, and in response to the trigger, which man are we going to tap? I guess I'll tap the Blood Crypt to top. So there are multiple potential lines of play here, all contingent on our opponent's board states. But since we don't know, for the sake of gold fishing, I'm going to do Wolf Run, Impersonator, Chromanticore. Uh, put it on top. The Relic Trigger will resolve. We'll produce a blue mana. On top of that blue, we will tap for one, uh, let's say, two, three, four with the Commander Sphere. We will cast our Seer Sundial. Then we will sack Commander Sphere to draw a card. It will be the Wolf Run. We will play the Wolf Run as our land for turn, triggering Seer Sundial. We will pay for the trigger to draw a card. It'll be the Clever Impersonator. I think the play is uh, one, two, three, four. Uh, we cast Clever Impersonator. If it resolves, it enters as a copy of Dawn's Reflection, enchanting our Gruel Turf. Um, then we will add one, two, three, four, to our mana pool, right? I'm starting to play sloppy because I'm just a little overwhelmed, but we'll tap Argothian Elder to untap this, to untap this with four still floating. We'll crack the top. Uh, no, we won't crack the top. Yeah, we'll crack the top. No, we'll spin the top. Oh, Jesus. Yeah, I'll do it this way. Three floating, um, we'll now crack the top. We will draw the Chromanticore. Top will go on top. Three, four, five, six, seven. We will bestow Chromanticore on Baleful Strix, and uh, we will then swing with the Baleful Strix, and I guess pump it once. Maybe a better play would have been to dump all of that mana into a stroke of genius to refill our hand so that we don't get totally hosed by a board wipe, but you get the point. This is all before turn six. Thank you so much for watching this Tech Deck Deck Tech. I hope you enjoyed it and got something out of it. Um, this is going to be the last Tech Deck Deck Tech that I upload to my Pogo Bat vlog channel, just so that, you know, my magic viewers don't see vlog stuff they don't want to see and my vlog viewers don't see magic stuff they don't want to see. Um, so click on the link to the Alicia video over there uh, and it will take you to the brand new Tech Deck Deck Tech YouTube channel. Woo! Until next time.